The Dyatlov Pass incident is, in my opinion, one of the greatest mysteries I have ever heard of, and it's still one that confounds me to this very day. This story of the mysterious deaths of nine hikers in the northern Ural Mountains on February 2nd, 1959, this was a trip they would never forget. And unfortunately, their demise is still debated by many until this very day. This is the true story of the Dyatlov Pass incident. So let's get into it. The group consisted of eight men and two women. Most were students or graduates of the Ural Polytechnical Institute. The goal of the 14-day expedition was to reach Ortorten, a mountain 10 kilometers or six miles north of the site of the incident. All members were experienced in long ski and mountain expeditions. They were all considered level two ski hikers, and this trip would have made them a level three, which would have been a very prestigious honor to be considered as such. It had been agreed beforehand that Dyatlov, who was the leader of the group, would send a telegram to their sports club as soon as the group returned to Vijay. It was expected that this would happen no later than February 12th, but... Dyatlov knew it would probably take longer, and Igor and the rest of his group were all well-regarded and respected, known to be skilled and responsible hikers. But on the evening of February 1st, 1959, something happened to the group that caused them to flee from their camp into the night and certain death. They were all improperly dressed and in temperatures around negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And so when the date passed and no message had been received, there was no immediate reaction. Delays were common when hiking up in the Urals. It was only after the relatives of the hikers demanded a rescue operation did the head of the Institute send the first rescue groups consisting of volunteer students and teachers around February 20th. Later, the army and police forces became involved with planes and helicopters being ordered to join the rescue operation. In my humble opinion, if one of these students were my own child, uh, I would have been the institutes and as well as the rest of the authorities' worst nightmare. I would have done everything and anything I could in order to get a rescue team in place immediately. And this very topic of how long it took to send rescue teams out to find uh, the hikers is one of the most unusual things in regards to this case. So why did the Institute wait so long before sending a rescue party? Why did the military get involved? Who the hell knows? These individuals, as far as we know, were not military, but one of the many theories regarding the military and the hikers will be covered uh, later on in this video. 
Sadly, on February 26th, the rescue team found the badly damaged tent. It was revealed that it had been slashed by a knife from the inside, meaning the hikers had left in terror from the inside out into the darkness, not properly dressed for the elements whatsoever. The tent was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Initially, two bodies were found, that of Yuri Krivoshenko and Yuri Doroshenko. Their clothing had been cut and stripped off and was found wrapped around several of the other bodies recovered later. They were both shoeless, and this suggested that the other members had scavenged clothing off of those who had died first, or in their terror, they could have grabbed whatever clothing was nearest to them and then fled the tent. The rest of the hikers were found days and months later, and the official cause of death for five of the hikers was hypothermia. The other four hikers were found with major skull damage, chest fractures, as well it was said by the then medical examiner that four individuals, Zolotarov, Kolovodov, Briganole, and Dubanina, seemed to have sustained injuries that looked to be what he would describe as associated with a major automobile accident. What has followed in the last 61 years has been nothing but conspiracy theories. And that's basically all we have to go on because the Russian government at that time immediately classified this fatal expedition as top secret. So why would the military classify this horrific tragedy as top secret? Were some of the hikers working for the military? Who knows? Were some of them spies, so to speak? Who knows? Was this expedition a guise for something much bigger, like a military experiment of some kind? I don't know. I'll have to leave that up to you. But in the end, the families of all the hikers were never given the truth as to how their sons and daughters perished on a mountain so far away from any civilization. And in my opinion, as to how these experienced hikers perished in the Ural Mountains back in 1959 will remain most likely a mystery. This case has been put on a shelf and forgotten about since the days of the Cold War. So this is basically what happened so long ago, but let me tell you about the hikers themselves and then we will get into the theories regarding this mystery. And let me tell you, there are a bunch of theories out there. So initially there were 10 hikers to start with. Ludmila Dibanina. She was 20. She was a fourth year student at Euro Polytechnical Institute and her major was engineering and economics. Yuri Doroshenko, he was 21, fourth year student. Uh, his major was radio engineering. Zaneda Komolagrova, she was 22. She was a fifth year student and her major was radio engineering. Igor Dyatlov, the leader of the group and whom uh, they have named this tragedy after. Uh, he was 23. He was a fifth year student at uh, UPI and his, radi and his uh, major was radio engineering. Rustem Slobodin, he was 23 and he graduated with a degree in engineering technology. Nikolai Tibu Brignoli, I'm so sorry, 23, graduated with a degree in civil engineering. Yuri Krivonoshenko, he was 23 and he graduated with a degree in construction and hydraulics. Yuri was working in Chilabansk at a secret nuclear facility. He experienced a disaster that is known as the Kish 
Kishtim accident. And then there was Alexander Kolovarov. He was 24. He was a fourth year student studying nuclear physics. Semyon Zolotarov. He was 38. He had already graduated from the Institute of Physical Education in Minsk in 1950. He was an instructor at uh, Kurakova tour base at the time of his death. Uh, and then there was Yuri Yudin. He was 21. He was a fourth year student studying radio engineering. Now, on January 28, 1959, Yuri Yudin was forced to go back because of an illness. It has been said that Yuri suffered from arthritis. Hey, I know what that's about, believe me. As well as back problems. And after a few days into the expedition, he knew he had to turn back. But this decision would ultimately save his life. And he would be considered the only survivor of this faithful group of hikers until his death in 2013. All right, now let's get into the theories. Number one, KGB agents in a controlled environment. Alexei Radikin, author of the book, Dyatlov Pass introduces the version that Simeon Zolotarov, Kolevatova, and Yuri Krivoshenko were KGB agents on a mission to uncover a cell of CIA agents. They were to deliver radioactive samples and then take photographs of the Americans, but something went wrong and the CIA agents killed the group. It sounds absurd now, but in a state of fear and paranoia, this was the only way to spy on the Soviet Union. Russians were not stupid either. They repeatedly fooled West, the Western world by radioactive tainted material from places that had nothing to do with it. And this brings us to the so-called theory of Western intelligence involvement. According to this theory, two or more members of the Dyatlov group were hired by the KGB to deliver fake proof of radioactive tainted clothes. The rest of the group was probably unaware of the real purpose of their journey. Radioactive clothes and usage of radiation detectors, gray foam on Doroshenko's face, and the absence of shoes and upper garments, and at least one camera missing. A conflict ensued, a fight, torture, and the brutal massacre of the entire group. Now, while this theory is thrilling in, in and of itself, it's not plausible in my own opinion. It seems very outlandish and something you would find in a spy novel or even in a movie. So I have to throw this one out, you guys. I don't believe this one at all. Okay, here's another one that uh, I have a problem with. Uh, hikers mistaken for gulag fugitives. Um, I'm going to throw this theory out right off the bat because in my own opinion, these nine students don't fit the bill of escaped prisoners from a Russian gulag. Uh, I'm not buying it, but hey, it's a theory that's been around for a long time. Uh, so I leave it up to you to decide. All right, military forces. Uh, British author Keith McCloskey, in his book, Mountain of the Dead, he suggests that the students stumbled upon a military testing area and were either killed by Soviet soldiers protecting the area or were scared into, the f into fleeing by the sounds of nearby explosions. Now, I've also heard of this theory before. Uh, it does make some sense to me because two of the deceased hikers were found to have radioactive clothing. And because they were found at the time of their autopsy with radioactive clothing, um, <clears throat> this theory does hold a little bit of water, but it does not explain everyone else. All right, and the fourth theory I'm going to tell you about is uh, some say the local Mansi tribe uh, did them in. Uh, nope, I'm not buying this either. Uh, let's move on. Number five, uh, this is my favorite one just because it makes me laugh. 
And number five is uh, magic mushrooms. Uh, the possibility is that the group may have ingested the mushrooms either intentionally or unintentionally and suffered the delirium and sweating with the acute doses. This would account for what appears to be the bizarre behavior of the group on that final night. This theory is not plausible in any sense simply because the nine hikers did not even take cigarettes or alcohol on the trip because they took this trek very seriously. Yes, it might explain their their demeanor and how they were acting, but it doesn't explain the whole entire thing. So I'm going to have to throw this one out, guys. But again, research this and I leave it up to you. All right, so number six. Yep, you guessed it. Uh, it's a UFO and aliens. Well, this photo I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you right here is the cause of this theory. I believe it is not a UFO or something paranormal in nature. I believe it's some kind of flaw in the film during development. So the theory of aliens is hard for me to wrap my head around. So when in doubt, throw it out, right? Yep. All right, number seven, avalanches and snow slabs have also been considered as well as with a term called infrasound. Now, uh, the definition of infrasound in a nutshell is a type of vibration in the air which has a frequency so low it cannot be picked up by the human ear. But a succession of studies has shown that it can have marked effects on the human body, including loss of sleep, shortness of breath, and extreme dread. But again, this may explain why they left the tent in such a hurry. But uh, as for their injuries, yes, I know if there was an avalanche that probably that could explain some of the injuries that looked like they had been in a car wreck. But there was no evidence to suggest when they did find the tent that there was evidence of an avalanche or a snow slab. So it kind of makes me feel like, yes, maybe that could be like part of the cause, but it doesn't explain everything in a nutshell. It just does. All right. And number eight. So lastly, there are two theories I would like to share that only a few believe. All right. Maybe this hike may have been orchestrated by the KGB or one of the hikers. I'm not going to name names, but one of them might have been an agent that was sent to test a drug on these innocent people in order to see if they would turn into some kind of super soldier. Kind of like how the CIA did their MK Ultra project and to see if they would turn into some kind of a super soldier and what the eventual, you know, uh, events of that study would hold. Uh, this has been put out there. It's, uh, it's plausible. It definitely is. It would explain the injuries to the hikers that looked like they had been in a car accident. But, um, I guess maybe the other ones who <clears throat> only died of hypothermia, maybe they had gotten away from this person and they were just left to have the elements take them and they would die due to being out in the elements not being dressed for the weather um this is definitely plausible but again you know there is not one theory that fits it entirely like a key into a lock there there just isn't and you know to think that they all would to turn into a bunch of jason bournes Maybe one did and they all got scared and that would explain the mass exodus out of the tent. And they're not, you know, all of them dressed in their night clothes and running into the wilderness wild as can be in order to save themselves. It could also explain the damage and the torture to Zolotarov, Kolevitov, and Bergnoli and Dubinina. Uh, it could, it could explain that, but again, you know, 
who who knows you know we're only guessing at this point it's best guess that's definitely what it is it's best guess Share with you so lastly maybe a 10th hiker or a so-called hiker appeared out of nowhere <clears throat> the group maybe gave him food and shelter and then he turned on all of them when they were most vulnerable you know they were most vulnerable when they were you know when they were more relaxed with him and they were all getting ready to go to bed and then boom he just went nuts and they got spooked and cut their way out of the tent and ran into the night he then hunted and killed all of them and maybe just maybe he was you know a super soldier from the so-called military base from the other theory I told you about. And uh, maybe the military base actually sent him to, you know, for them to study him and to see what he would do to these, uh, these nine defenseless hikers. Who knows? I have no idea. Yo. Okay, so that's it, everyone. I've been chatting uh, for the last uh, 35 minutes. So... Uh, this video is going to be a pain in the butt for me to edit as usual. So remember to like and subscribe for more videos. Remember to uh, hit the post notification bell so you will be notified of all of my videos in the future. I thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching everybody. Bye-bye.